Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. Miller of the Ditch That Textbook Podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great educational podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Edgy Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fessich, and today I have with me Ryan Tibbins, who is an English teacher and a podcaster, and he's going to be sharing all about how to get stuff organized, whether it's digital, physical. But first, we're going to start off with his teaching story. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. This is great. Um, you know, I, I love, by the way, the, that that intro talking about organization, because I don't know if you can see around me here. I, I, I'm, I'm a piler, but I, they're, they're all such neat piles. <laughs> like, I, I love it. You know, I, I love it. I do have piles as well and bins and notebooks all around my space as well. Yeah. So, all right. So we're going to get into my teaching story. I'm just going yeah. to, so that in case anyone wants to know what kind of guy I am, I am, you know, in most cases overprepared, but sometimes in the dumbest ways, when we moved to online school and I brought stuff home from my classroom room. I was like, all right, what supplies do I need for my classroom? I got to grab stuff fast and get, I brought uh, a stapler, a box of paper clips and a paper tower. And... Um, Ryan, you would not be a good person to be, to be like deserted on a desert yeah. on an island with because. Mm. Well, you know, you know, it's fine. Like in, in those things, I'm like, I'm usually very good, prepared, whatever. And it's, I was just like, I looked at my desk. I was like, what would I use? What do I, what do I use? What do I need to keep myself organized? <laughs> and I grabbed the stuff that I used to keep myself organized when I'm in person, <laughs> whatever else, you know? So I just took all that stuff back to my classroom not too long ago. Anyway, so that that's <laughs> for anyone who's going to listen to this for advice. Just be careful because that's the kind of guy you're listening to. Uh, <laughs> I love it. So. I love it. So my teaching story, um, I am in my 15th year of teaching high school English. Uh, I work in Northern Virginia, originally from Pennsylvania. I was always sort of, you know, good at school, but largely by virtue of luck. You know, I tell my students now something I do at the mm-hmm. beginning of every class. I go through the plan. I say, who has any questions? And I say, you know, and ask questions, you know, answer questions about the plan. And I say, who has questions about anything in the universe? And they love it because they think they get to pull me off topic. But for me, I, I, I'm like, you just need to be interested in learning. And so they try to stump me. And I always say, like, I had the good fortune of being good at school because I have a sticky brain. Like, I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't earn that. You know, I just you play I the things. game. Yeah. Well, you know, and I hear things and I remember them. And so, you know, it doesn't mean I don't study, but I probably study less than a lot of others. And so I think it's important to keep that in mind. You know, so when I'm teaching, I always think about that. So going through high school, I, you know, I was all right with school. I did, you know, pretty well. When I went to college, I was an English major. And then I started taking anthropology classes that I really liked. And I ended up adding an anthropology minor. And I think I was, I was one class, one or two classes away from a second major. And I had a professor try to convince me to stay. And I was like, why would I pay for another semester when like no one will ever pay me for anthropology? Right? Like, <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not jobs for this. Um, and then, you know, probably about halfway through uh, maybe sophomore year of college, I think I had some friends from English classes who were training to become teachers. And they said, hey, why don't you take, you know, why don't you take this class? We're going to check it out. Uh, they have a fifth year master's program. So you get to stay in college. That was the sales pitch. Mm-hmm. You get to stay in college for another year. And I was like, well, I do love college, right? Um, <laughs> I do love my meal plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like everything about this. Like if I I could have done the Van Wilder and just stayed, I I would have, you know, the biggest mistake of my life was finishing college college. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, so I, I took the classes and I, I took the classes for arguably all the wrong reasons. Like I'll, I'll say this honestly, and you can give me a dirty look and I would completely deserve it. But <laughs> I took the first class and I was like, that was mildly interesting and mostly easy. And so I got the sense, I was like, I'm going to get some easy A's and, and pull a sweet GPA. 
And I didn't have, I had an interest in education, but I wasn't real serious about it. I didn't think it was something I was going to do necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I had for a while there, I wanted to be a college professor, like be an English professor. And around the time I was getting done with undergrad, um, yeah, I knew I was going to do the fifth year program, but I was thinking about taking GREs and things like that to go to grad school for English. And mm -hmm. my best English professor essentially talked me out of being a college professor. Um, not directly. He just sort of presented, this is what your life will be like, or you could go teach high school and be an awesome high school teacher. And this is what your life would be like. Mm -hmm. and I was like, all right. You know, and that was right around the same time when the, when the practicum experience really sort of kicks in. And that mm -hmm. for me was when I said, Hey, you know, I want to teach because I really loved being in the classroom. Like the, the being the student in an education class was, I didn't hate it. I just, I didn't love it. It was, it was okay. Mm -hmm. Some of the classes were great and some were, eh. um, I never had a bad experience in the classroom though. You know, I mean, I had bad days, so, you know, yeah. bad days happen, but I never got to the end of a week and looked back and thought I'd wasted my time or I didn't enjoy that. And I really liked the idea that there's I, a difference there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and to know that if I did my job well, I was helping other people to do their jobs well. And so yes. for me, that was sort of a powerful motivator. Um, it's kind of a weird comparison, but when I, through college, I landscaped in, in, in like summers and I used to love, <clears throat> I used to love at the end of a, a long day, you know, we'd work 12 hours and then I would go back out with like friends who were going to go somewhere and I would go out of my way to drive by what we had just done. Like, I'd be like, I'd be like, Hey, you see that? I, I mowed the lines on that field or, Hey, you see, you know, we did that. And the idea that like, I know I've produced something like you could see what yes. I've done. And what I found was that once I was in the classroom, it was a similar experience. You know, a kid could write something at the end of two weeks they couldn't have written at the beginning or had a student giving a speech who on the first day wouldn't even raise their hand to talk in class. And so for me, the actual classroom experience is what made me both passionate about being a teacher, but also solidified for me the idea that there was something I was really going to do. Oh, I love that. And I think when we, when we talk about our, for our students who are education majors listening today, um, the importance of getting into the classroom early and often, freshman year, try to get those experiences if you can with an observation or try to do some volunteer work or something like that at your church or vacation Bible school or work somewhere that, you know, has kids. So you're getting the, the small little experiences where you can actually see the theory um, played out in practice and applying what you're learning in those content area courses when it comes to teaching, seeing how it works in the real world and the real teaching experience. Yeah. And, and with that, I, one, I think you want to get every opportunity you can and to look for experiences where you actually get to teach like the, mm -hmm. ob the observing is fine, but that puts you in a middle ground. You're not the teacher and you're not the student. You're sort of this third party, mm -hmm. you know, um, when people look at a football game, you say how many teams are on the field and everyone says two. And it's like, well, but you're forgetting about the zebras. Like there's a, there's a third team there and they have a different experience than the other two. And so that role of observing the classroom is important, but it's not necessarily a thing like, I worked as a writing tutor at a student writing center for three years in college. I learned more about how to teach writing by teaching writing than I did in an yeah. actual class about teaching writing. You know, I, to this day, I tell kids like I, ha at least half of what I'm teaching you, I learned and figured out because I had to figure out how to teach it to people there. Mm -hmm. um, something I didn't do, but I think if I had been more serious about education earlier on, I wish I had done some substitute teaching which ah. is which is dangerous because if you go in and you have a rough class, like if you're not careful, that I can see how that could turn a person off. But mm -hmm. if you go in and and learn to control a classroom a little bit and you can be fun with it, you know, most teachers have relatively low expectations for how much is actually going to get done when the sub is there. Mm -hmm. So you, in most cases, there isn't a ton of pressure on you and you get to have that experience without someone else in the room sort of breathing down your neck, so to speak. So mm -hmm. that that's something I didn't do. But in retrospect, I wish I had taken just occasional substitute jobs while I was in, in undergrad to help me tie some of the, the theory I was getting in, the, in my yeah. classes to some actual practice, which for me didn't come until the, the second half of my college experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So today we're talking about organization and organization looks different for everybody. Uh, digital organization, actual things that we're organizing, those piles that you have so lovely behind you. Um, so I know as a future teacher, they're getting lots of content given to them, whether it's worksheets or PDFs or 
books or workbooks, whatever it might be. What are some tips that you have for getting them organized, all, all the things organized from stuff that they need for classes, for stuff that they need for teaching? Um, I remember as a future teacher, I'd go out to like yard sales and things like that and get all the kids books I could and all the things you know, I might need one day. Um, so yeah, so what are your, what are your tips for organization? So, okay. I mean, there's so, there's so much I know, here. Such a big <laughs> there's so much here. Just real quick for the book thing. I just, you said that, and I, you know, yard sales are great. Estate sales look mm-hmm. for like an online auction house in your area. These places are blowing up. Like as the baby boomers are getting old and checking out <laughs> there, like there are so many things for sale. So cheap, just find an auction house and you can stock a classroom with the coolest furniture, with all the books, <laughs> with everything, because people now have like you know, there are people in middle age who have their own homes and have their own stuff and they don't want to inherit their parents' stuff. <laughs> and so you you can get everything you want if you're if you're clever about it through thrift stores and things like that. That's actually a great place to get books for your classroom as well. Most thrift stores get overloaded with books. They can't sell them as fast as people donate them. Mm. So if you call around, tell them you're a teacher, they will usually give you a discount. And a lot of thrift stores actually offer, usually they do it once a month. Uh, they call it like their brown bag sale where you give them five bucks and they give you a brown you know, paper shopping bag. And mm-hmm. You can take as many books as you can stuff in the bag. There are awesome opportunities. Nice. So as you're just getting into a classroom, you're thinking, how do I get the materials? You know, use whatever budget is available to you. But I strongly recommend you think about, you know, secondhand thrift stores, uh, auctions, yes. things like that. Um, it's one that's, you know, environmentally friendly. It is <laughs> pocketbook friendly. Yes. Um, and and you, can, you can find some really cool and creative things that maybe you wouldn't have considered elsewhere. Now, once you get all the stuff, you know, how do you, how do you organize it? Um, <laughs> I have the stuff, now what? <laughs> yeah, now, now what do I do? Just throw it at the kids. Just throw it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, no hardbacks. No, the, um, I, I think that a big, a big part of this, and, and for me, it, it drives organization. It drives communication. It drives the way I teach in class. You have to clearly know the purpose of what you're trying to do. Like, if you don't know why you're doing something, you have no chance of doing it as well as you possibly could have. So, you know, when you're thinking I'm going to be a teacher, you know, make sure you understand why. When you're teaching a particular lesson or skill, make sure you understand not just why you're teaching it, but think about it from students' perspective. Why should they learn it? You know, because sometimes you're teaching it because it's interesting to you or because it's on the standardized test or whatever. like saying it's on the test is fine, but that is generally one of the worst ways to sell information to young people. Yes. Um, you can mention that it's on the test, like that's not going to hurt. And so for some kids, that's what they want to hear. But if you can demonstrate some real value in their lives, um, you know, and, and it, it just it helps everybody to understand, like, this is why we're doing it. This is why it's worth my effort. When we think then about how we organize say, our physical stuff, do the same thing, you know, define a space in your classroom or, or you know, as your pre-service teacher, define like a space on your desk where it's only the stuff that you're going to use for your education classes. Um, now, most things are digital. You know, when I was in college, we were it was in that transition where like we were doing a digital portfolio, mm-hmm. but I still had a paper copy of everything. Right. So it was mm-hmm. really important to have a few a few clearly labeled and and well-organized binders, even though all the same binder stuff was going into, you know, a digital portfolio as well. Sure. Um, I would say that something that's really, really important that sounds silly. And I think it's, it's something that we assume people do. And I have learned that this is not like, you know, we assume that students can type uh, because, Hey, they just computers are everywhere. But a lot of kids today take like a, like one semester of keyboarding in like seventh grade, I have so many students in AP English, they're brilliant and they, they hunt and peck. They're like, it's, it's insane. Right. And so I, I think that we shouldn't assume because people have access to technology that they're always going to use it well. And so mm-hmm. something that we should be very purposeful about, I don't know if we need to teach it, but it's definitely something individuals should think about is how you organize information on your computer or on your your cloud space or however you're storing your your data, clearly marked folders that are and and I actually do this two ways. Yes, you know? clearly marked folders. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what like, did I save that as? Yeah, what was I yeah. thinking that day? I. I I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not like real tense about this stuff, but I look at my wife's work laptop and it just, it, I can't even look at it because everything's just like dumped on the desktop and there's like a hundred icons. And I just like, it makes me a little bit nauseous, Um, (laughs) but like I I actually keep almost everything twice, you know, if the drive space allows, I have things in folders by like topic and content. I then also have it separately organized as sequence. So here's how I'm going to go through this in the year. And I have it marking period one, marking 
mark period two, mark period three. And then inside each folder, it's unit by unit. But I have almost all that same information in a separate setup that is, here's all the Shakespeare stuff I have. Here's everything I have about punctuation. Here's everything I have about modernism or, you know, whatever it may be. And so that way, if I have a, a student has a question and it's about a specific topic, if sometimes you can, oh, which folder is that in? Do I teach that in October or November? I don't have to mess around with it. I go straight in. I can find the topic. So um, sometimes having sort of a, it's almost like, you know, a filing system essentially, but mm -hmm. doing it digitally really gives you some flexibility. And so that's really, really important, um, especially as you're a pre-service teacher, because right now you're collecting a lot of stuff and yes. a lot of the stuff you're collecting, you don't necessarily know how or if you're going to use it. Exactly. And um you know, it, it teachers, I think a lot of times turn into pack rats, you know, like if, if you look at older <laughs> no. teachers, you know, they, they, they've got five filing cabinets and a rolling wardrobe and you're like, <laughs> what is all this stuff? It's because they don't get rid of anything uh -huh. right? because you never know when you might use it again. Now, the reality is there comes a point where like, you're just not going to use it again and you need to get rid of it. And for most people, the time it, it, when you actually clean out those filing cabinets, et cetera, is if you switch schools or you retire. And when you retire, mm -hmm. you just tell the other teacher just come in and take what you want. And then you look at the custodian, and you slip them 20 bucks and say, burn the rest of it. You know, <laughs> it's just, I'm, I'm done, you know, but um, it, it, it is important to go back through and try to remove things you don't need. But um, for the audience that, that we're speaking to, you're a long way from not needing it. And so mm -hmm. every single time someone gives you a sample unit, save it. Every mm -hmm. single time somebody offers you a worksheet or, hey, here's the short story that worked, just save it. And have, mm -hmm. have a, have a file dedicated. Like I always put, I start my files with Z if it's something I'm not going to use anytime soon. So it's at the very bottom of the list of folders. I only look at if I'm going there, but it's like Z other people's stuff, AP Lang, Z mm -hmm. other people's stuff, uh, you know, whatever the, the topic is. And then I can always go to it. And so sometimes when I feel like, oh, I'm teaching something new, you know, I don't have it. I have all of this stuff that people have shared and teachers are remarkably good about sharing yes. their, their stuff. Like I love and hate the word stuff, but in this conversation, we use it a lot, get all the stuff you can, but if you do not organize it as you get it, you're never going to like, if you just right. dump it somewhere and let it sit and say, Oh, I'll get to that later. I promise you, you never will. Right. So get yourself a, a system that works and, and do that right away. Uh, same thing goes for emails. And this will get more important when you actually move into the classroom, you know, have a folder that is parent emails, one that's student emails, one that's staff emails about students, one that's just for admin, one that's for attendance, one, whatever. And then I, every day I go through and every time I respond to an email, if it's something that there is a 10% chance that I could ever need to refer to it again. It goes in a folder mm -hmm. less than 10%. I just delete it, but everything goes in the folders. And then I go through and I archive things, you know, around the end of each year. And that way it sits in the archive and it dies a slow death, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but, but everything's there. So if anyone says, Oh, Hey, does anyone remember what we talked about on blah, blah, blah? I go, give me 30 seconds. Cause I'm the guy that has the email. Not because I had to do anything special. I just had to have a folder where I put it because mm -hmm. I had to get it out of the inbox. I can't, you know, if you're a person with 3000 things in your inbox, um, you know, yeah, yeah. Like you guys can't see Dr. Sam right now, but she just tensed <laughs> up in a way that oh, yes. Like that it's... makes me so nervous. Like I am like, it has to be like five or less. That is like my goal, five or less emails uh, in the inbox. Wonderful goal. I'm right now in my, my work email, I'm probably about 20, but I use, that's something else that I was going to say, I use my inbox as a to-do list. Mm -hmm. So if there's something I need to do, even if I've responded to the email, it's the email stays in my inbox until the issue is resolved. And then I move it to one yes. of those backup folders. And so, yes, the goal is always under five. The only time that happens is like leading into spring break or something like, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm leading into the break and I'm like, all right, I got all this stuff done. I'm down to four. And then, you know, by the time I check my email again, I'm back up to 30 and who knows. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the organizational piece is really find a system that works um, because you're going to accumulate a lot of stuff. Like your professors are giving you tons of useful stuff right now. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate reality is that some of it doesn't seem that useful because you're not in the classroom yet, or some of it seems like it's going to be useful. Maybe it won't be, but mm -hmm. um, you know, options are power. So when people, people say knowledge is power, um, that's a lie. Knowledge is inert, you know, knowledge <laughs> does nothing. The question is, how do you use it? And so what I always tell my students is that knowledge gives you options it does. and options give you power. And so when people present you with materials you can use in a classroom or, you know, good ideas that you might want to reference later, 
you want to keep it because every one of those things is now an option for you. I can do it. But if you can't mm -hmm. access it, if you can't keep it organized, then it's not really an option because you're not going to find it. So, you know, early on, you want to devise a system where you label, label all these folders by class or by content or whatever it is, and then give things clear, you know, clear names, <laughs> try to be descriptive um, and, and, and use it because, you know, I have, my Lord, I have thousands and thousands and thousands of files. And, you know, how many of them do I use? Not that many, mm -hmm. but it's great to know that I have that to fall back on. And I have things I can grab at any moment to meet an individual student's needs. So um, the, the labeling and the filing is really, really important, more so than I think most people would expect. Labeling and filing both in the digital sense and in the physical uh, binder folder sense as well. I think another big part of organization is that to-do list uh, or to-don't list or the list of shame or whatever you want to call that. How do we get how do we get that started up and running, maintained, organized, and all that stuff? Oh, I see the post-it notes I'm, are on the I'm screen. low tech. And and <laughs> the more the more I share, like I used to be ashamed of this. And what's funny is the more that I share that I do this low tech post-it note thing, the more people who go, yeah, I've got the post-its too. That's what I do. Yeah. So you've got the you've got the yep. the, the notebook list. So yep. what I do and and I do it because it's a physical reminder. Um, I know a lot of people do a great job with digital calendars, like Google Calendar is great. Uh, if if your school uses, say, Microsoft Outlook, the the scheduling and calendar functions are are great. You know that all works well. The problem is I only see it when I'm at the computer. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of maybe setting some priorities and thinking about self-care, I strongly recommend that unless you're in an administrative position, I strongly recommend that you do not have your school. Uh, th thinking as a job, like as a student, this is maybe a little different, but when you're a teacher, I strongly recommend that you keep your work email off of your personal phone. Um, you don't need to be bothered at 10 o'clock at night when you're trying to enjoy yourself or spend time with your family. You don't need to hear the email go up, even if you don't read it. The fact that you were yeah. reminded about it, 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 it kills your mindfulness. It takes you out of the moment you're in. And then you think, oh, what's that about? You say, I'll read it in the morning, but now it's hanging over your head. Yes. Right? So don't look at it until you're ready to deal with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, personally advocate for when you're at work, be at work, everything you do is work. And when you're at yeah. home, try like, don't do the work unless you have a dedicated time or, you know, reason for it. Um, for me, the post-it note system uh, works really nicely because I make one that's for the whole week. And then I make one that's for the day. And nice. if I do a really good job, I cross a few things off. And if I do a really good job of prioritizing my day, there's enough space on the post-it to add stuff for the next day. And the next, I should be able to use it for two or three days because if I fill it up, that means one, I'm either writing down things that were obvious and I was going to do anyway, mm -hmm. or I'm trying to cram my whole week's worth of work into one day, which is one, stressful, two, makes it hard to prioritize the list, and three, can be overwhelming. And I think mm -hmm. we've all been in the situation where when you think you have too many things to do that you can't accomplish, you know you can't get it done. So that becomes sort of a passive excuse to not get it done. Mm -hmm. So make targeted lists day by day. These are the three things I have to do today. Yeah. I might get a bunch of, but these are the three or these are the four, you know, whatever it is, try to keep that number small. And then, you know, as I go through, I, I work on my week long list. When I was in college, I did that exact same thing, but in a more formal, like printed planner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I actually, I, probably have one in my briefcase, to be honest. I, I I still have the planner. I just find I don't use it in the same ways I used to. What I what I put in a planner two years ago now goes into a Google calendar. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I'm only looking at when I have the intent of opening the book or opening up the calendar and looking. When What do I need constant reminders of? Those are the post-it notes I keep right in front of me on my desk. Um, mm -hmm. I can easily toss it in my pocket. So I walk away from the desk. It, <laughs> the daily notes go in with me just so that I don't get wrapped up somewhere else talking to someone in the office or doing something. And then I pull it out of my pocket. Oh, wait. Hey, you know what? It's great. Talk. I got to get out of here. I got a couple of things I got to take care of before I leave today. Yes. And so it, yes. having something that for me, that's mobile, that can go with me and that's easy to read. I don't have to open an app. It's just there. I, I think that can be really, really useful. Yeah. No knocks on planners or digital calendars. I think they're great, but um, having, having the easy to access sort of physical reminder for me is very important. Now you talk about having that weekly to-do list. How do we prioritize what's on there and how do we choose what we do each day? Now I know there's due dates and things like that. Maybe that's what helps prioritize, but how do we go through prioritizing all that stuff on that weekly and then dividing it up across the five days? So, okay. So this is sort of a, an app that bridges the gap between these last two topics. <laughs> I have, I've used this a little bit, so I'm not an expert, but I have some friends who, um, 
both are teachers. But I have some friends who run their own businesses and you know get very busy with things like that. And a lot of people love the app Trello, T R E L L O, which sort of does the same thing. Like you can create sort of cards or, or sticky notes and things like that, but it's all virtual. You do it on your phone, but you can sync it to other calendars. You can set reminders. It's really, really cool. And it gives you the opportunity to share pieces of the plans with other people and keep other parts sort of private it mm. it's very cool it's very simple it, you can integrate it with other calendars and things like that and the reason that I, I bring that up right now is because it makes it very easy to create personal reminders and personal lists for planning a family vacation and sharing that with one group of people and then creating something for work and keeping that for yourself or sharing with others um I would say that in all of this, it comes back to that that idea of, of purpose. As a first year teacher, uh, you know, when that happens, you are going to be asked to do a lot of things. And something that even very good principals do, and and I know why they do it. I don't love this, but um, when there is something that needs to be done in the school and they don't get any volunteers, they they go knocking on that first year teacher uh, <laughs> because one, you don't know enough to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you're trying to be, you know, good employee and get to know people. So it's hard to say no in that situation. And, and two, you know, the, the positive of it is that usually that principal is trying to get you involved in the school community and culture. So things like being in high school, being a class sponsor or sponsoring a club, you know, and we need an adult to do this one. Yeah. Hey, the, the newbie is easy to pick on, but two, it's a way that it really sort of gets you ingrained in that school community. So I like that principals ask. I just wish they made it more clear that you can and maybe should say no sometimes because it's right. easy to become overwhelmed with those things. Um, perhaps the most important piece of advice that I could give today on these topics is that you need help prioritizing early on that when you're a new teacher, everything sounds important. Yes. You go into a faculty meeting and it's, well, hey, everyone has to take this survey. Everyone has to answer this email. We need to do this. There's this training, blah, blah, blah. Don't forget to contact the parents. Hey, and build great relationships with your students. Mm -hmm. And like, you're like, well, if I did every one of those things the best I can, that's 20 hours a day for the next five days. You know, and that, that's not reasonable. And mm -hmm. what you have to do is, is start to sort of read between the lines and figure out what is vital versus what would just be nice. You know, what do you need to do versus what would be nice to do? And that's a place where as a younger teacher, I think you need to find an older teacher who you believe is generally a good teacher, but maybe is also sort of a good employee, someone who you see builds good relationships with students and maintains good relationships with the school administration, because that person has found a way to be good with the kids and good with the boss. And I guarantee you there's some stuff they're not doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the person that can help you decide what to do and what either not to do or what to do later and things like that. Because you say like, well, I have all these things on my weekly list. Yeah. And if you treat them all like they're equally important, you're not going to get them done or do them well. Like I mm -hmm. tell, I tell my students all the time, you cannot go through your life treating everything like it's of equal importance because you'll end up just being, you know, mediocre at everything. And that's optimistic. You'll probably just be bad at a ton of stuff. You or have super to... overwhelmed. Yeah, but you, well, yeah, maybe you do get it all done, but you're very unhappy, you know, mm -hmm. in the process that can create a lot of anxiety. So, um, like, remember why you're a teacher, like, what yeah. are you trying to do? And then think anytime you're asked to do something, does this contribute to that purpose? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I want to uplift individuals. I want to empower students to, to do what they want to do in their lives and in the world. I try to connect that to, you know, sense of community and virtue, because I would like whatever they do to also serve the community. That's up to them. But mm -hmm. I, I certainly lean in that direction. Right. And then I want to get a paycheck, you know, like those are the three things I want them to be better people to be empowered to do what they want. I want them to be able to serve their community. And I want to keep getting paid along the way. <laughs> and so when I look at any list of things I have to do, I go, well, does it meet those three requirements? And I go, well, it's, it's not doing the first two, but if I don't do it, they might stop paying me. Well, then I better do it. Right. Yes. Or I go, well, you know, this one sounds important, but I go, I can still serve the student and community goals. And if I don't get it done on time, they're not going to fire me mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, they're not going to complain. Right. And it does. And I'm not saying to be, you know, don't be lazy, don't be casual about it. But the reality is we're asked to do far more than a person could possibly accomplish during your contract hours. And as an as a young teacher, it's really difficult to sort out what is what is vital, right? And right. so that you, you want to lean on some older teachers, and you want to keep your purposes clearly in mind, because that'll allow you to put the most energy and time into things that really matter the most to say, you know, supporting those students or maintaining those relationships or 
collecting your paycheck, you know, whatever it may be, but um, you, you need something to guide the priorities. And, and if you don't have those ideas clearly in mind regularly, um, you're probably going to get worn out pretty fast. Ryan, I think I think your last piece of advice is a great one that we're going to end our conversation on today. We talked about purpose. We talked about organizing digital, physical stuff. <laughs> we talked about our to-do list, prioritizing, keeping those three main things in, in mind and why, why you're a teacher. I think that's super important, not only for our future teachers to focus on why are you a teacher, you know, to go to classes and, you know, to learn these things, but also why do you want to become an educator of excellence and keeping that forefront in mind. Ryan, I know that you have an amazing podcast, ClassCast. Could you please share about that and where my audience can find you, connect with you, and of course, subscribe to your podcast? Of course, subscribe to the podcast. So um, you can you can find you know me on social media at uh, ClassCastPod on Twitter, and then it's the full at ClassCast Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can find the podcast, uh, ClassCast Podcast, sort of I do sort of the big, big picture talk. Um, so it's a lot of sort of, you know, philosophy or policy or with a goal of how do we do all this better. And so you can find the, the podcast, additional information and some contact stuff at www.classcastpodcast.com. And it also streams on all major services. So wherever you like to listen to stuff, it should be there. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, I really, really love, um, I love interacting with people in general, but when people listen, so, you know, if, if anybody does happen to check any out, like leave a comment or send an email because a lot of times that informs future conversations. So uh, nice. if anybody happens to check any of this stuff out, uh, don't be shy and, and drop a comment because that, that totally makes, makes the next conversation even better. Thank you so much, Ryan, for being on the show. Thank you for having me. There you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you. <laughs>